producer, arranger, conductor, ticket taker, projectionist. No. My friend Ernst Jorgensen, who worked on the new 50th anniversary. Ernst Jorgensen. This in 1974 with that little. Oh, you weren't born then. Oh, yes, I was born then. Me and my family and my kids went to the record store and picked it up, and then I went to pick my son up at high school. Um, first of all, I, I find it interesting because I did start doing some research when this 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 anniversary approached. Uh, before we start talking about the music of what you did to to the from the tapes, take us through the timeline. I mean the. The concert happens in January, on uh, the, and, and, and the album came out pretty quickly. Well, it came out uh, as a worldwide release within weeks, also yeah. in America, uh, but obviously without the support of the uh, TV special America that wasn't shown until April, it, it had a more uh, precise impact around the world because, you know, you saw the TV show and it was there two weeks later or three weeks, mm -hmm. whatever it was. So uh, that was a rush release, but RCA already knew how to do that because they'd done the same thing with Madison Square Garden. Exactly. Where the idea was to get Square Garden out before the bootleggers were in that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the other thing about Aloha is, I mean, you can look at it in isolation. It, it, to me, it's maybe the ultimate triumph of Elvis's career. If you go back to 68, live a little, love a little flops, a little less conversation get to 70 on the charts. It was an absolute low point. And from then on, 68 TV special, Memphis 69, live in Las Vegas, that's the way it is in 70. Uh, four sold out concerts in uh, Madison Square Garden in 72 and Elvis on tour. And then this. Yeah, that's right. And, and though there has been the legend, and obviously part of the legend is true, the legend that it didn't air, the Aloha did not air in America on that Sunday night because of the Super Bowl. In fact, Elvis on tour was still in the theaters, and they kind of didn't want both of those like out at the same time. So one of the things that a lot of us don't remember is that that TV special in America what didn't come to television until April. So I was listening to this months in advance of, of, of that. Now you talked about how quickly they got Madison Square out, but how quickly they got this out. That was kind of the... First week of February. Of February. So less than two weeks almost later that it's out. Um, that was their version of streaming because that's about as fast as you can press vinyl from tapes. Tell me what the process was with how they worked on the music that quickly to mix. Well, it, it will actually spill into the what, where we're going to end this story in that they, they, uh, they re recorded it over two nights and, and then you know uh, they took to the Hapes to uh, Los Angeles and they mixed the album in one day, January 24th. They had made the sleeves without any titles on it. So it was, they, it, they were ready and only had to put a sticker on it with the titles when it came out. So they didn't have to wait to know the track listing because Elvis was notorious for not <laughs> yeah. giving away track lists. So, so that's what they did. It, actually, they did that with Stuck On You back in 1960 where they made a, the single sleeve with a hole in the middle. So they didn't have to print anything other than 50 million Elvis fans can't be wrong. Mm -hmm. And then you could look at the title because there was a hole. Center. Yeah, that was back in the time RCA literally would book all the pressing plants and say we're just waiting on the tapes to press. So we're ready to go to get it out. And the thing about this is, didn't know this until we saw the special. That's not from that photo was not from Aloha because they had already printed those. They printed the sleeves already. So all they were waiting on was the vinyl to, to put in everything and get it out in stores. So a one day mix. What did they drop the ball on? with one day? Well, 
This is subjective, obviously. Sure. Yeah. But uh, I remember when I saw the TV show and I bought the record. I loved it, of course, because I was nuts with Elvis. But there was something close, a little narrow, a little less glamorous, a little less uh, grandioso on the sound of that and on the TV special. And I thought nothing of. I actually thought in my head, oh, it's been difficult circumstances to put up the mics in that showroom in Hawaii. But I got lucky. I met a guy from Memphis, Matt Ross Spang. Oh, yes. I see. Matt, you mean the Grammy Award winning producer? No, 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 no. I met that nice guy. Oh. <laughs> but, but he's making, you know, all kinds of modern records that you and I may or may not like and all that. But he's an exceptional mixer. And when I came to him with Aloha from Hawaii, it was a little bit like, oh, come on, you, you can't ask me to, to do this. Uh, but I did. And, and, and we've done quite a few things with him recently. And he's really exceptional at picking out the right things to emphasize and the other things to tone down a little bit. It's so little detail that most of us wouldn't recognize it if we just saw him do it. But when you get to the final result, you suddenly have, as he would always say, I start with Elvis's voice. I have one thing that's more important than anything. I want my hero, Elvis Presley, to sound as good as he can. The thing here is that his voice sounds so much better on this new three CD, uh, one Blu-ray release we've done, that it's almost like hearing the, uh, the whole thing from, from start again. And he builds it up so, Instead of spending one day mixing the entire album, it spends one month mixing the stuff. Yeah. And then obviously with new technology, a man with better ears, and then this kind of attention to it, you can do better. Yeah. And he has done so much better. So if you have uh, Aloha from Hawaii at home, you should seriously consider if you don't want to hear it sounding much, much better. Well, here's an example. We've got the song Something that you sent us. Yep. What should we listen for as we listen to this? What did you guys do? What did Matt do to this for us to listen well, for? It's got to be different from, from each person, but the first thing that I obviously concentrate on is whether when this guy says he's going to take care of Elvis's voice. I'm his boss, so I'm going to tell him whether he succeeded. Yeah. <laughs> and he did. But then, you know, when you hear the arrangement here on the big speakers, listen for the little details, piano riffs, strings, all of these little details that when you have it on a so-called multi-track uh, tape with 16 different pieces on it, you can obviously turn something up, turn it down, make it lighter, make it brighter, echo on it, you can do a million things. And this is what a brilliant engineer does. He takes care of the little detail. It's not the piano all the way through that he cares about. It's the little detail where it lifts the arrangement of the song. And th this is what I really want to leave you with. This is something that, it's called something, uh, that, that, that really shows not only Matt Ross Bang as the engineer, but also how good that original show was and how great Elvis was in January of 1973. Take a listen, something from Aloha from Hawaii. Yes. We're going to talk right now a little bit about Aloha from Hawaii. 50 years ago this year. Couldn't be. Couldn't possibly be. Couldn't. <laughs> I've done the math. It involved a lot of gazintas, but I was able to figure it out. Tell me your memories of, uh, of uh, when did you guys find out, when did the TCB band find out, hey, we're going to do this thing in Hawaii? When did you find that out? Well, actually, I believe we went over there in October and played uh, in that venue. Yeah. As I remember, I'm pretty sure we did. I don't know. 
uh, just to f be familiar with the place yeah. and familiarize yeah. Elvis with it. Uh, but uh, we all had a good time doing that show. It was very enjoyable. And Elvis was pretty well perfect. Yeah. He looked pretty good. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. W was there anything different? Because you guys had already had, you know, tours in Vegas and you were already a, a, a unit working together. Was there anything different about this concert than there was about the other shows that you were doing up until that time? Did you approach it differently? Oh, I think we had some different songs in there. I, I believe I, uh, as I remember, I arranged five for the Aloha special, so we had some some different songs, that, uh, and even more than the, that five. Yeah, but all in all, just kind of an, a, a normal show for Elvis. Did you feel like he was under any more pressure for this than... Uh, I would have been a little nervous if I'd known the entire world was going to be seeing. What about you guys? Well, uh, that's the question uh, people always ask. Uh, it, it, I know this sounds silly, but to us, it just seemed like another TV gig. Really? Because it was like this here, you know, you can't really see the audience very well, and uh, it was freezing cold in there, as I remember. And uh, we could see the camera people and their red lights uh, would come on. And otherwise, I mean, so it was just like doing TV, man. Yeah. <laughs> Elvis is so comfortable, at one point he throws a glass of water on you, so obviously he wasn't that nervous. Yes. He was known to be a prankster a little yes. bit on stage. Yes, he was. As a musician for you, um, I've been with you before listening to Elvis music. Um, you've worked with so many different artists. What was there about Elvis's voice and connection to the lyrics that might have been different than the way another artist would approach a song? Um... That's a tough one because he he just had some very special way of doing it, and I, I'm not sure I could unravel that for you because it, it was something wonderful, and even I couldn't figure it out. Yeah, just a mat. You can't explain magic, right? You know. Uh, for you as a musician, you uh, you still continue to uh, to go around the world playing Elvis's music. Sometimes with him on the big screen. You told me one time, man, he, he continues to look great. And, we just keep getting older and older. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what yeah. is it about that connection that you still have with him, even though he's on tape or on digital or whatever they do with it? Do you still have that, that connection with him when you play? Well, uh, yes, I think so. Uh, yeah. It uh, looks like it, yeah. Yeah. And I go play his music with people in Europe, you know, yeah. uh, quite often gonna go in January. There's a gentleman over there named Dennis Chao. Uh, been working with for about 20 something years in a row. And we do um, uh, quite a bit of Elvis stuff. Yeah. So yeah. I enjoy doing that. I enjoy working. <laughs> and, and I'm not ever gonna stop, by the way. There you go. You guys in the TCB band have a special relationship with uh, with the fans, you know. You were guys that, when I was buying the albums and the A-tracks, your names weren't listed, you know. I never, except when Elvis, you know, introduced you, which must have been pretty cool to be on the record. Elvis, you know, like we just saw, introducing you. But we've gotten to know you guys over the years, all the TCB guys. You have a, a special relationship with the fans. Tell me about what you think about the Elvis fans who have now, obviously, then and now become TCB band fans and Clint D. Harden fans. Well, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? <laughs> it is nice. It really is nice. Thank you all for coming. Uh, and you know what? If I, I never go downtown in Nashville. Uh, it's just too busy down there and too crowded and too drunk down there. <laughs> but uh, every, every time I, I do, which is not very often, uh, foreign people, believe it or not, uh, 
find, seem to find me, and it, it amazes me. So, Glendy Hart, Glendy yeah, Hart. They catch me, and uh, they're yeah. from all over the world, and it amazes me. It's a great yeah. thing. I enjoy no. that. Yeah. You're famous, Glenn. Uh, that's what I heard. Yeah. <laughs> Question Elvis asked you one time, what kind of name is Glenn DeHarden? <laughs> one of the things we love about you is, is you're always available for the King and you're going to be a part of the Aloha special concert tomorrow night. And Andy, Andy Charles is putting that together once more for the fans. What can you tell us about what's going to happen tomorrow night? You're just going to be back with the King on keyboards for a while? Yes, and now I'm going to do like I did on the original one, just kind of sit back and then watch, watch it flow and enjoy myself like I always do. There you go. I've had, my wife and I have had so much fun these last couple yeah. of days going around and seeing all the exhibits and seeing the ripple effect uh, that Elvis has had, the impact and influence on each one of our lives. It, it's amazing the light that he has yeah. brought into this world and it's, it's, it's amazing. And we had uh, lunch with, with Donna Presley the other day just, and just to catch up on things that are just... Um, brought back so many memories as we talked yesterday about yeah, yeah. and our experience with Elvis. And to see Glenn back there, oh, and, and Alan Blind, his wife, Rhea. You, you guys, the Osmonds, um, have much, much more, as I started doing more, much more of, a, of an impact uh, with Elvis, a connection with Elvis, than, than I had originally anticipated. I've, I've gone through and I've kind of edited down some of the imagery oh, that, that we had. Yeah, I had to. some clips of the yeah, you know, uh, First thing I want to show is, is just the Osmonds' connection with Vegas, and, and take a look at this billboard here. Okay. Oh yeah. So you guys, so the Osmonds, we you know we grew up with you. You guys were on TV, and Williams, right. and all this stuff. That's right. What what got the Osmonds to, to Vegas? Well, we were performing with Nancy Sinatra in in, uh, in Vegas, and I don't know if some of you remember that, and that, and it was really fun uh, uh, with with, uh, <laughs> with Darlene Darlene Bla uh, with the Blossoms. Dining Love, yeah, she was there in, in Vegas, and so we went over with um, uh, to the International where Elvis was. Uh, so Nancy took the show over to the and it became the Hilton. And now the and, uh, <laughs> some, and that's where we met Mac Davis and and the TCU band and, and the Imperials, and so we were performing uh, with with uh, uh, Nancy and. And we had come from a background with the Andy Williams show, a very, very uh, tight, organized, really, I mean, it was like perfect, uh, you know, the dance moves, everything. And, I, and I, you told me you have a clip of, of that uh, performing. But, and this is what Elvis saw in the lighting booth. He was watching us in the lighting booth yeah. perform at the International Hotel. And he saw us performing and uh, this kind of thing. I don't know if you have a clip on Do that. we have that? I don't, I'm not sure what they... This is, this is how we used to be until Elvis had an impact. And I want to I want to show you the kind of impact Elvis had on us. Uh, I don't know if they have that clip up there, but... But anyway, but he's, he was... But he's watching you... But he was watching us from the, the, lighting, the yeah. lighting booth. And we got a message from Nancy uh, that Elvis would like to, to meet us. And of course, we were in shock, and, and uh, uh, we thought, "Wow, this is uh, amazing!" So we go up to his his penthouse, and uh, and all of a sudden, the doors open like that, and there's this big smile. He, he says, "Brothers, welcome!" <laughs> he says, "Come on in, brothers!" And so I, I was, you know, I was 15 years old, and the impact that it had on my life is. Uh, I, we, we all changed that night, and there were, there were these pinball games. Uh, he, he loved pinball, and televisions everywhere. I remember televisions, and uh, but he, he, I was playing this pinball game, and it had Las Vegas on it. And he comes up to me, and says, "Now, Jay, you, there, there's a secret to, to this game." He says, "You gotta, you gotta hit the ball over in that corner." And I thought, 
is, this is really happening. Elvis is pressing, he's telling me how to play pinball. <laughs> it, it was like surreal to me, you know, and I think back, and, and then he had, uh, I know that uh, he, he had this uh, uh, conversation with us and how, how he was, um, he had this, first of all, he had this love for uh, his fans. And he told us, you know, brothers, I can see what's going on and, and I, I want to help you. He said, uh, I know that you, you're, you're, you're heading towards uh, success and I, I'd like, to, I'd like to, to, uh, to visit with you, come back afterwards in my show. So we went back uh, to uh, when he did his show. And, and he introduces us in the audience, and that's on Hillbilly, uh, his Hillbilly uh, album, yeah. Cat album. And, and we, we go backstage, and he says, okay, um, uh, I, I gotta be honest with you, brothers. Um, <laughs> he said, I, I love your act, and I think you're really good, and you sing great, and you play great, but uh, you gotta match up your look, man. <laughs> And he, and he, I, I could just feel him struggling with that, you know. Yeah. And, and yeah. he says, uh, he says, come here, I want to show you something. So we we go backstage. I mean, back to his dressing room there. And he and and I think there's a clip uh, where where his his closet. Uh, he opens up his closet. Oh, yeah. And yeah. All these, the, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, jumpsuits. Yeah. And and those who have followed uh, our our family. Notice that we changed overnight. Well, let's take a look at that. This is before Elvis. Take a look at this oh, album cover. Oh, those are an album. There we go. That's see, that was the album cover that we got. Yeah. That's before Elvis's influence on the boys. Uh -huh. And then the next one is after Elvis has gotten a home. <laughs> And by the way, these are all my albums oh, that, right. I had, that I had Jay sign the other Oh, that's what I signed. That was, yeah. Uh, that, uh, when, when that happened, I thought, they're stealing Elvis's look. <laughs> they're stealing it. You weren't stealing it. You know what? He, he took the time to reach out to us and, and take the time and, and pull us in. And, and to really take the time. And he got with Bill Ballou, that Bill Ballou, uh, and he got with him and he said, and he said Bill, I, I'll never forget this, and I thought, he, this is Elvis Presley, the busiest man in the world, taking the, the care and the time to, to uh, uh, help us. And he says, I want, I want you to, to uh, design uh, similar to what I'm wearing. These guys need to look, he, he, said, he says, I want them to drive the girls crazy. <laughs> said to us, he says, first of all, brothers, you know I love you, but I, you got to lose the tap shoes, man. You got to lose it. <laughs> so that night, we, went, we took the tap shoes away. And, and, uh, and then so we, uh, we did much of our luck, obviously, yeah. but it also impacted our, our music. Right. You'll notice that the music changed, and, we got, and Crazy Horses was also influenced by uh, Elvis, yeah. and, and Down by the Laser River. Everything in our lives, you know, you think about uh, the magic that this person had, uh, you know, uh, he, not only did he bring a, uh, a unique talent to this world, but his humility that he had, and his love for the Lord, love for the country, and love for the fans. I tell you. I, talking with him and we got those impressions but look at look at all of you you have the same impressions from him and, and we got those those feelings from him and he told us he says brothers he said uh, if I could do it again I would I would go out and shake hands with every one of my fans and and, and I and that really impacted us yeah. and that really uh, to that day we were always uh, because he said the fans are so important your career and your life, and, and he was right, and and uh, he prepared us for what was to come in the 70s when we hit the UK, right. and there's, I don't know if you have a clip at all. Well, one we, thing I did want to talk about was that when he, so he first put you in the jumpsuits, yeah. and then he came back after seeing you and the, everybody in a white jumpsuit, and what, what was his response about all the, the, the brothers being all in white? 
Oh, it, it, he, he thought it was amazing. He said, that is cool. I remember the word that he used. But he had one problem with identification. Okay, yes. <laughs> Wait, yes. Yeah. Okay. We had this we, Bill Ballou design that we all looked alike. And this bothered Elvis. He says, he says, Bill, he got with Bill and he says, Bill, they have, they need individualism. They're too much alike. They, they, you know, they, they even smile alike, you know. <laughs> and, 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 I never forget when he said that. It's like, they even smile alike. And, uh, but then, and so he says, change, change them, give them colors, uh, you know, like, and then he asked me, what, what is important to you? And I said, well, what would you like to be? And I said, a warrior. Bill, write that down, a warrior. And then he said, to Wayne, what would you, what do you like, Wayne? And he says, uh, I love to fly. So he, he says, wings, put wings on wing. So what he did is he individualized each one of us. And so that we weren't, so we had these jumpsuits. And, and, and by colors. Too. By colors, yeah. And then <laughs> Bill Ballou's friend, who did, uh, later on in the 80s had uh, a Ninja Turtle. Yeah, but he, he, he gave us these colors. And, and uh, Bill Ballou's friend, who was uh, Ninja Turtles designer, he says, I like what you did with the, the Bosmans. I'll, I'll give that to the, the turtles. So he, he gave Donatello purple and Donnie and, and, and Michelangelo orange. And it was the funniest thing. Who knew there was a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles Osman in action like that? Do you believe that was so cool? I, uh, I, I just thought that there's some, there's some fun, funny things that I wanted to just so, so you guys, with with the Osmonds, as you as you go into the '70s and this impact of Elvis on on your career, um, it it you had an unlikely fan. I mean, you didn't know that that he was watching all those shows, but he had a connection to your family through the music, I think, and, right. and the sound of the right. brothers' voices. Yeah, well, he he saw some of the, the Andy Williams shows, and that he knew that we he loved our family harmony yeah. and his his uh, his love for harmony. And uh, he thought, uh, he, he knew that we could sing and dance, but he wanted to, to uh, strengthen us. He wanted to, to help us, to move us forward, and, and he did. But, but I think he had more of an impact on me personally, the kind of person that he was to me as a brother. I just looked at him as like a brother. And I, I, uh, um, I, I just, he just, he just, um, you know, you, you think that Elvis Presley, and I was a little shocked, of course, at first, but when you get to know him, I thought when he said that up in his penthouse, he felt like he was in a fishbowl. And, and, and I could feel a sense that he was lonely. And that, that, but he wanted a family. He loved family. He, he loved my parents. Yeah. And um, he had a great connection to my mother, especially. And, and, uh, and he... Um, why do you think that was? Uh, I think, I honestly believe because of his, he, he told my mother that he loved his mother so much and he missed her badly. And that he, um, he, he would call over uh, to, our, uh, to our suite uh, at times to mo and ask my father if he could speak to my mother. And, um, and he says, uh, I, mother, uh, I, wanna, I just want to talk about Jesus. You know, he was, uh, and he says, I love the Bible. And, and my mother was a theologian, and she, and she loved the Bible, and she could talk to him. But my mother was very positive. You know, I remember her saying on the phone one night, because I would eavesdrop a lot, and, and she said, now look at it this way, Elvis. And, and she remember her saying, without a struggle, there's no progress. And, and uh, she was an amazing lady. Yeah. And, and, she, and she, I remember her saying to him once, this too shall pass. And uh, one time, though, it was really funny because my mother was in a conversation with some friends, and Alan came in and says, uh, "Mother, Elvis is on the phone," uh, and she says, "Okay, tell him to hang on just a minute. I'll be right there." <laughs> and I'm thinking, who tells Elvis Presley to hang on? <laughs> you know, it's like really. And, but she she looked at him like one of us, one of the brothers, you know. And you know, uh, back in those days. Things were very tight in, in, in Las Vegas, and we all got to know each other different, uh, you know, times. Yeah. But, but uh, I cherish, I cherish my time, and that, that I had just a small piece of his life, and that he had a major part of my life. Yeah. You know, last a few days ago, when we were playing with Six Wire, yeah. Elle, and James Garrett, and and then John and Pam and Dennis and yeah. 
uh, you know, Darlene, came, and, and all these flashes of memories came back to my mind uh, about this, about how um, uh, this guy is a superhero. Man, I, I would put him up against Spider-Man any day, wouldn't yeah, you? Uh, we were, we were, were we wore the jumpsuits and he goes, look, he's got capes. He's, he's, he's Spider-Man. He's Batman. He's Batman. Batman. Yeah. That's right. Uh, he come, we come, we, you said, he comes out at night. He wears a cape. He's got mini Batmobiles. <laughs> and you never see Batman and Elvis together. <laughs> you know? He's Batman. But one of the greatest things I think he did for us, besides change our look, our, our music, our, our dancing, is this East Hood. One day, one day he said, brothers, you need some karate in your act. <laughs> and, and so I know that I think you have a couple clips. I, I got a I got a still here of you guys in karate class. Now don't mention your teacher yet. Okay. okay. You know. So there are the Osmonds getting a little macho, and and Elvis's uh, own karate instructor, El, uh, Ed Parker, couldn't take you. That's right. So he talked about he told the Osmonds about an up and coming karate instructor. That's right. This up and coming, uh, he's going to be really, really good. He says he has all these schools, and his name is Chuck Norris. And, and, and so he, Chuck became a great friend, and he gave us karate lessons. I think you've got a clip of us. Uh, I, I, I don't know if we've got it. We've had a we, bunch we, of stuff we yeah. had to go through. And then yeah. what, was, what Elvis loved the most, uh, what not, not the most, but one of the funny things that I remember seeing him up at the uh, lighting booth was, was that he was laughing every time little Jimmy came out because Jimmy was the first Elvis Im Im uh, impressionist. That's and right. he, he was in the Heartbreak Hotel. Yeah. And Elvis would just crack up every time. <laughs> and so he had Frank Sinatra come in one night and Jimmy had to learn uh, that's life. Cause, and, and Frank Sinatra threw his hat at Jimmy and, and this is when we were with Nancy yeah. Sinatra. And, and you know the memories that, that, that have been. But you know one of the greatest greatest memories of my life and honors was to be asked to play in the TCB band. To, to I was gonna, that was one of my, I wanted to talk about your connection uh, with Ron Todd. Well, well Daryl uh, Tony, who was an amazing, he's in the Imperials, connected us with D uh, uh, Dennis J Jail and, and, and so, and then Ronnie was actually my, my drum teacher. Ronnie played with us when, in, 19, in the 80s, he was on tour with us. And uh, Ronnie and I became really good, really close. And, uh, and what a great Christian, what a great yeah. man he yeah. was. But, it, but then to be um, uh, asked to, to fill in for him when he broke his hip, and when we were in Buxton, England. And you can see the clip, I don't know if you have it, but you can go Google it. Yeah. But, yeah. But, uh, and then to see, oh man, James Burton, Glenn Harden, I mean, those yeah. guys playing with me, and, and, and to play, that was, that was the, the most uh, amazing moment of my life, to play that. Giving back to your teacher. Giving back to the teacher, yeah, Ron Todd. Ron Todd, yeah. And, um, we spoke to a sweet wife, Donna, the other day, and she says, go, be sure to see his exhibit. And, and, I saw those drums, and I, I think that was the set I played on that time. And, and, and you know, but Ronnie was, he, uh, he told me, he says, I, the reason he got the job with Elvis mm -hmm. was after all those, in, you know, he, he was they had auditions. On audition, yeah. Everybody played on his drums. And by the time it was over, he never had a chance until the very end. And Elvis said, no, we're going to listen to you. You know, you came all this way. And, and the reason he said that he got the job is because he followed Elvis. He w he wasn't just there to show off his he wasn't there to show off his skills, but he he, he knew how to play. He knew how to be a team player. And you know when we and I did that song "Burning Love" the other night, it, you'll notice that it, it rushes a little bit. It, 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 the, the speed it gets a little faster. And I asked Ronnie why why did you pick up the tempo? He says, well, because Elvis did. <laughs> Follow him. And I yeah. thought, wow, is that the coolest thing? And yeah. so and when I was singing um, uh, uh, Burning Love, I, I, it just brought that memory yeah. back. Now, you met a lot of people. You knew the king of rock and roll. But you also met someone else of royalty. And I just had to show this, this photo. Um, there oh, you are. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> So you've met, you worked and knew the king of rock and roll, and you met the queen. Oh, so the well, Osmonds I, were 
I've been very blessed. Worldwide. We've been very blessed as a family, and, um, and there's, we, I, I wrote, it took me five years to write a musical about our life, and it's going to be coming to America. I was it went just, over I, the, I the was, UK. You, you read my mind, because <laughs> I knew that you had, had worked, and, and you told me something interesting, and it's, it's true about life. Everybody has their version of the truth, and if, if five people are in a room, there are five versions, five of, versions of that story. But you've written the Osmonds story. And it, this is from my eyes, and how I saw growing up as an Osmond. And, and we do have a clip of that, of the, uh, the, the, the sequence from the, the show where the, where the brothers meet Elvis. meet Elvis. But I want you to just talk just for a second before we show that about how, how was it to con 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 condense a, a story like the Osmonds? Into it was the hardest thing I've ever done, five years. and. And uh, um, I, I, when I turned it in to uh, um, the producers, uh, they said I had three musicals because uh, I had so many stories. But it, it was the hardest thing to condense it, to make it live, to pace. You know, the pacing was important. Yeah. So there are 30 songs in there, and uh, but it was very, very, uh, it was very challenging. My wife had a. Uh, she helped me so much. Put it. You had you had something mystical happen though about a call to move that ended up coming. We a reason why something happened to you. You're a firm believer in there are things that happen for a reason. I, we we really did. we were being very prayerful about where we needed to go and what, what was the next step in our lives. And we were both living in my wife and I were living in St. George, Utah, and uh, we both. Uh, fell no not at the same time in the morning my wife felt we need to go to england for some reason mm -hmm. and she didn't want to tell me because we had already moved so many times and, and i didn't and, and later on i got the feeling that we needed to go to england and uh and so at dinner time i said sweetheart i just have to tell you you're going to think i'm crazy but i think we need to go to england and she says thank goodness you got you were listening we were being very prayerful so we just picked up and within that month we were living in england for and we didn't know why. And so our, uh, Robert Wells and Maria Wells, our friends, and, and Billy Dean said, let's go to Sweden and for a day but we can. So we went to Sweden and there was the producer uh, uh, right there who uh, came up to me and, she, and he said, um, uh, uh, Bosa is his name, Bosa Andrews, and he said, I, I want to do, do a show on you. I want to do a musical about your life. And, uh, and, and I says, well, we're writing a book. And he says, no, I want, you, I want it in a living memoir. And, 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 I, and so that's when the musical idea happened. And he says, but you have to move to England. Because you, I went, you know, with the, <laughs> you, the producers are here, and, and you know, Andrew Lloyd Webber's producers and directors and writers are here, and, and, and they need you here. And I, and I says, we just moved. So there's where you need to listen. That, that's a testimony to me to listen. So you work on this, you take it into the offices, you've got three musicals, so you've got to start cutting. That's really hard. But one thing survived, many things I'm sure survived, but one of the things not lost in the edit was your version on stage in the musical of the moment that Elvis is a part of the yeah. life of the Osmonds. Is that a good setup for yeah, that's our... That's a good setup. Our, I don't know what clip you have here. Next up, we were off to play in Vegas, and one night after the show, we had another royal visitation. <laughs> Welcome to the Hilton 
love Elvis and the Colonel. Wow. And the Colonel came backstage and he said, now, I want you guys to be, uh, listen carefully to what he says because he respects you, and, but trust me, he knows what he's talking about. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think, I think yeah. that's proven oh, all these years. And, but we were respectful, we were under the impression that, that he was very private. So we never took pictures, and like a lot of people, Mac Davis, right. a lot of people yeah. didn't. And that's, I regret that, but still, but we respected that, but still, uh, uh, he had a, a tremendous impact on my life personally. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad you were able to come and share the Osmonds story and your story you. with Elvis. And for those of us out there, myself included, who want to go see the Osmond story on stage. Well, do you know when you can see the clips, that, that I sent a lot of clips. If you look at Jay Osmond Facebook mm -hmm. uh, on Osmond Connection, we're going to put a lot of those clips on there. Great. And we'll so, keep the news of when you guys and, and then the, active on social media. So yeah. uh, send them a message, tell them hello, and, t and, and uh, tell them you appreciate you know, what the Osmonds uh, did, and I think the Osmonds looked pretty cool in those jumpsuits. Well, well thank you. <laughs> Jay Osmond, everybody! Thank you very much. Before they announced it to the public, so I would settle down. And I'm so excited. I love to find out that there are people out there that were friends with Elvis that maybe sometimes you don't know the connection, but I found this piece of video when I started searching, and I think it'll help me introduce and show the kind of fun relationship these two gentlemen had. So just, just take a look at this. This is from uh, backstage at Clam Bake, behind the scenes. who someone is, but in this case, all I have to say is, ladies and gentlemen, Elvis fans, Lee Majors. Dark and stormy night. <laughs> oh, no, 
that's my wife, Jeff. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, you know, I was writing, writing a memoir, uh, and I have been for the last two, three years, and I just suddenly finished Elvis's chapter about two months ago. So maybe a little bit of this is fresh on my mind, and I thought, well, to help me out, I'll just pull some excerpts from it and, and share them with you if I could. So uh, anyway, uh, when I was graduating from high school in 1957, that's where Elvis was here buying this, this mansion, which he finally named Graceland. I never thought that 10 years ago that I would be meeting him, actually. But I met him in 1967 on the Four Star Studio lot where I was filming Big Valley and he was filming a movie called Clam Bay. And the producers of Clam uh, Big Valley were producing his movie. So he was, uh, uh, Elvis was, was obviously a huge fan of the Big Valley, believe it or not. And he liked my character. And he said he wanted to meet me. And so when they told me that, I said, well, Heck, yeah, I'd love to meet him. <laughs> so anyway, I got to go back. One thing is in 1964, Elvis was doing a movie you might know of, sure, it's called Kissing Cousins. <laughs> well, he, uh, he played identical twins, and he, uh, he, 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 to give him a different look, he had to dye his hair and tend it blonde. And so his bodyguards, you know, they all were watching that show. And, uh, the bodyguard started teasing him, saying he looked a lot like me, like Heath Markle, you know, the Big Valley. Because <laughs> that first season, if you're Big Valley fans, my hair wasn't like. They made me do it because that way I would maybe be more apt to be Linda Evans' brother, who was, she was my sister, Audra, on the show. So that was why I had to tempt mine, and you know why he tended his, but uh, anyway, that's how we both ended up uh, with tinted hair. <laughs> <laughs> I, anyway, I was on the, they brought me over to the set of his movie where he was shooting, and he and uh, Shelley Fabre, uh, and they were in a swanky restaurant, and they were sitting at the bar, and Elvis's character, he was doing his best to woo this girl, you know, and so I was watching from the shadows, and uh, he didn't know I was there. And, uh, but I did see that the waiters, they were wearing uh, these little tassel hats with the little, you know, Shriner hat kind of thing, and a little shiny vest and everything. So uh, when uh, they had finished rehearsing and went away to their trailers, uh, Arthur Nadell, the director, he came over to me and he said to me, he said, let's, let's you want to do something with this? I said, oh, sure. So. I went back and I got into that outfit with the wardrobe people. They put me in the whole outfit, went to the makeup lady, she put a mustache on me. And then they, uh, when they came back, I was to slip in behind them as the waiter and clear a table. Like, they're here, and right back here. I mean, they're directly behind them. Would you like to see that? Yeah, and then that then they would be able to see it. Let's take a look. Lee Majors in my first time. It's a big problem. First night, you're the first girl I've met. I thought I'd take a ride and look around. Would you like to come along? Just 
started laughing out loud like crazy. <laughs> the producer directors and the whole crew who was in on it, uh, naturally, uh, they, they had a lot of fun out of that. So, you know, <laughs> practical joke started after that, believe me. <laughs> surprised by him because, believe it or not, we both are rather shy and well-mannered uh, well, well and, and we were raised, we were raised where it, like here, where it's yes sir and yes ma'am. You know, he, he came from Tumalo to here and I lived across the line only 400 miles from here at a place called Middlesbrough, Kentucky. Right on. Yeah. Uh, so, somebody, the one person that lives there is here. <laughs> Anyway, I can even tell us there. You know, there our parents taught us right from wrong. He took us to church, and that's the start, and, and uh, where we both uh, started developing our faith. And he was, you know, the gospel music and stuff. So anyway, uh, let's go to July 31, 1969. And Elvis, that's when Elvis made his first appearance anywhere in eight years. And it was at the International Hotel in Las Vegas. And uh, had one of the largest showrooms in Vegas at the time. The Clark County Fire Department said you could only have about 1,100 people in here. That's the official count. But they stuffed 2,000 screaming fans in there. <laughs> <laughs> it was called the Hilton Hotel. And, uh, and Elvis went on, he did two shows a night on the property for seven years. That's a lot of work. An eight, like an eight, a seven or eight o'clock show, and then a ten o'clock show, and it, that's that's the uh, to do that for seven years, it wears on you, and I, and I think that was kind of the start, uh, you know, wearing down a little bit. But every year when my series was shut down, I would go the summers, and, and, and I'd go drive over, and I would see either the, the late first show or the late show, because I had a little cabin over there on the lake. That was my hideout, but uh, he had a huge penthouse on, a, on the top floor. Had uh, had all the trimmings, you know. And he had a pool table and a great bar, and uh, a lot of great food and stuff. And you know, always some guests invited up uh, after the late shows. And, uh, and I was still getting to know the members mafia, you know. And that's the bodyguards, as you know, and surrounded them at all times. Anyway, the first night I was up in the, up in this room and after the last show, and uh, there everybody's playing pool or something, and, and as I say, I was always kind of shy. And so I, anyway, I, I sat on the couch, kind of where I could just check out and observe the scene. The young lady came up, came up, and she uh, she sat down and uh, she looked over and says, you know, like. Who the hell are you? <laughs> obviously had a couple of drinks. I mean, I, you know, I, I know, he had my, like, my third or fourth year in Valley, but I mean, nobody knew it then. You know, I, anyway, uh, I, I said, I'm just a friend of Elvis. And she proceeded to give me a slap on the cheek. And I, I, I was looking. Why? <laughs> I knew that she had a few to drink, but uh, anyway, because he came over, and he pulled her up, and he asked her, he said, did he say something to offend you? And she said, I don't know, I just didn't like his attitude. <laughs> I think Elvis took exception to the fact that this woman had insulted one of his guests, because he then slapped her right in the face. And said, there, now you know how it feels. Sonny, said, Sonny, get her ass out of here. I swear, that's the <laughs> Well, look at the guy said to me, you know, he must like you a lot to do that. Uh, 
you know, and I, I was kind of shocked he did it, but I thought it was classy. But it was <laughs> some of it was classy. <laughs> anyway, a mutual respect was really born there, and uh, and the guys became good friends. Red and Sonny West, Joe Esposito, Jay Shelley, Lamar Fike, to name a few. Elvis, okay, after another show, I mean, there's, a, there's a many, many, many shows. I'm trying to pick out just a few for you. Uh, but another show, uh, Elvis and uh, Red and Sonny came over to me, and I didn't know what they wanted, and they huddled around me, and then they, and Elvis pulls out this gold chain, and he puts it over my head, and it's a TCB. And uh, I said, welcome to the Memphis Mafia. <laughs> and, uh, I had it right here today. It's one of my favorite memories from uh, 50 years ago, or more, maybe. But, uh, you know, all his Memphis buddies, uh, he knew them well, he trusted them well, and I think when he welcomed me into that group, uh, I, I really, you know, uh, to me it was a big thing. I'll never forget that. And y'all knew what the TCB stands for and everything. I can skip through that. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, here. And once when Elvis was ready to go down to the stage from the penthouse, uh, just outside the penthouse door, there was an elevator. I think it was a uh, service elevator. And we'd, they, we'd bring him out and we'd open up the thing. And the, the wheelchair would be there. And Red would step in on one side and Sonny on the other. And, of course, they both were carrying, you know, pencil. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he'd sit down, the elevator would go down, it open up the kitchen, and then from there they would push him all the way through the kitchen, which is a long kitchen in Vegas Hotel, and through some other hallways and around, it seemed like a quarter mile. And once the show was over, then he would come off stage, and he'd sit in the chair and they'd throw several towels on him. He was just sweating. I mean, it was the trip back was a little faster to get back to the to the uh, elevator. Uh, you have to understand this is Vegas, and it's always 110 degrees in the summer there. And that kitchen was a sauna with all those full ovens going. And so, <laughs> I said, "Come on in, son." <laughs> all he said was, "Holy shit!" <laughs> He left in front of it all, and, uh, and another weekend when he came off the stage, I was in the wheelchair, <laughs> and Red and Sonny started racing away with him chasing us behind, cursing us to leave the car. We turned the car so fast, the chair tipped over against the concrete wall. I broke my watch all over the thing, and I'm on the ground. Red's on the ground, and Elvis got his revenge. <laughs> So was when Elvis would, uh, it was on the other end of the stage, and he had a time when he would, uh, and I was always standing behind the curtain somewhere, but he was over there, and he'd come out, and he had all these silk scarves around his neck. I'm sure you've seen it, if not in person, if, you know, in, uh, in films and stuff of his show. And he would lean over into the audience, and the girls would swoon and take a scarf, take a scarf. And so, I got some scarves over there from Red. <laughs> Put them around my neck and I do a little, I do a little slow motion walk out. <laughs> and, and he kind of looks over and I'm leaning down and he grows and he says, that's enough, Lee. This is my show. <laughs> this is my show, you know. It's my I did a little slow motion by and walk off. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, I guess that's why you named, nicknamed me Double Trouble. <laughs> that was after one of his films. So anyway, that, that's true. Uh, this is an interesting one <laughs> because it's a little more more intimate, kind of, but there was a time after the first show, I, I knew I was going to leave to go back to my little cabin over on the lake, and uh, so I 
it's been a little town. Because I know it's, it's like half of the football game. You gotta go to the bathroom, you gotta that. You know, towel up, look clean. So I, I was there and uh, I said, oh, where is El? I, I kind of most refer to him as El. And uh, uh, they said he's in the dressing room and there was a court going, going under the door. But they said, hey, you want, want you to come in. So, oh, okay, so as I was going, I saw a couple of little glasses and a bottle of bourbon. So I just kind of brought him in with me because I knew he was on the phone. So I sat down, he's on the floor. Small closet kind of thing with some clothes in it, but he's on the floor, and I guess the long court. They didn't have cell phones back then. You know, it, was a, it was a phone that went, the line went about a mile down through the other hall. And of course, Elvis and all the boys are out there, and this was a private conversation. Oh, and believe it or not, I know it was a girl, it was Linda Thompson. Yeah, Linda was on the other end. And, uh, and that was uh, when they were first dating. And uh, I don't know, I guess they were getting along, but it seemed like a serious conversation. But she's coming up next, you can ask her. <laughs> ask her, I don't know if Elvis told her I was on the, on the floor. But... <laughs> so anyway, uh, you know, also, you know, the guys are hanging outside, colonels out there sweating bullets, looking at his watch. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so finally, uh, uh, he came to the door and knocked, and it was showtime. Showtime, but while I was in there, I poured myself a little shot of little shot of little glass, and just sip it, and I said, like that? And he said, yeah. So he, I put one down on the floor, <clears throat> and a conversation, and he'd pick it up had a little sip. And I wasn't paying attention, but he drank that whole sip, you know. <laughs> I didn't know that he really didn't drink. And honestly, he didn't drink. And so, <laughs> that's why the colonel was pacing out there. <laughs> anyway, I said goodbye. I headed back to the lake house, but Red told me later that um, Elvis did a lot of that second show on a stool. <laughs> He did most of the show in school, and the colonel was not too happy. <laughs> I mean, you know, Elvis didn't ever want to admit it. I mean, I'm sure you heard it, but he, he always wanted to just do movies, but he wanted to, to do dramas. He wanted to be an actor uh, and thought well uh, as an actor instead of the shows he did, because, you know, it, he just didn't like the little musical and having to sing and everything. And, Let's face it, some of them were good, and some of them were fairly mm, good. <laughs> but uh, the colonel, you know, he had a stranglehold on him, believe me. And if you ever saw the movie, I'm sure you did, the Elvis movie. But that was that was Colonel Parker in there. And Tom Hanks did a heck of a job. <laughs> see Elvis drink or take drugs or anything like that. And the guys that were closest to him really cared about his health. And Elvis always said he would not see 50. He told me that. And, and, and everybody, at one time or another, you know, and you know, his mother passed at 46, and he passed at 42, which is unbelievable. I mean, it's such a shame. And it's, yeah. To this day, it uh, bothers me. But anyway, Sonny, Sonny wrote a book called uh, 2007 called Elvis Still Taking Care of Business. And he asked me to write uh, something in the back of the book, uh, which I did. And I, I think it's one of, the, one of the best of Elvis's books. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. And uh, Linda Thompson, of course, who you'll hear later, she wrote a wonderful book. And, and there you can she, you can get behind the scenes really <clears throat> because you know she was with him you know his girlfriend for many many years there uh, but you know and you know several years later in 1976 Colonel Parker fired Red and Sonny and he also broke up with Linda 
And to me, that seemed to change him. It really did. That's when I saw that. Seemed to. I never saw him much after that anymore. You know. And it's funny, interesting, because Red and Sonny, they passed away within two months of each other in 2017. And uh, anyway, this is what I wrote on the back of Sonny's book. To this day, I strongly believe that if those people had stayed with him, he would still be with us today. It's hard to be the king. She's the reason that I'm still here today, for sure. So I keep the faith. My wife, uh, Faith Majors, is here somewhere up there. <laughs> Thank you.